In One Piece, your origins play a big part in your power, story decisions, and dreams. For example, Sanji only having his mother and his sister show any affection to him as a child leads to his excessive simping towards women. So what if, what if I so told you Jesus. Nami's origin as a war orphan gives us a hint towards how she can predict the weather with 100% accuracy. Just like how Poseidon rules over the seas, perhaps Nami's predictions rule over the sky and the weather. And what's an ancient weapon that has dominion over the sky? Oh yeah, it's Uranus. It gets even crazier when we dive into characters like Chopper, whose forest god fruit might be the reason he managed to tap into the wavelengths of a zone with rumble balls. To figure out these questions, we have to dig deep into the past of the straw hats. First, let's begin with the captain himself, Monkey D. Luffy, whose origin is still shrouded in mystery. We know that 19 years ago, Monkey Deadbeat Dragon met a baddie who was so bad that he stopped everything he was doing and got her pregnant giving birth to Luffy. But we still don't know who she was because we know old lady Gloriosa's generation. Then Shaki came, but there is a gap in who the Empress was before Boa. What we know from Gloriosa is that love is a hurricane and Hancock is in love. And who is a man that brings wind wherever he goes? It's Monkey Deadbeat Dragon! Gloriosa also tells us that this saying of love being a hurricane comes from the East Blue. Bro, who's from the East Blue? It's Dragon! We also know that two prior empresses of Amazon Lily before Boa died from being burnt by love. And looking at Dragon's track record of leaving the ones he loves to go get milk, that checks out. This dude, all he does is disappoint. Every week for the past six months, all I have felt from him is disappointment. That hurricane in my heart for Monkey Deadbeat Dragon, it's being extinguished right now. He better move away from that chair and come to Egghead. But anyway, this is a video about the origins of the Straw Hats. Uh, not Dragon Update. Also, why did Kuma send Luffy to Amazon Lily specifically during the time skip? Was he trying to send Luffy to his roots? Uh, Kuma and Dragon were hella tight, so he definitely knew who Dragon's Pookie was, and that's why he sent Luffy to Amazon Lily to learn about his mother. However, Dragon's origins don't stop there because Dragon's mom was actually a celestial dragon. So Luffy has that going for him as well. This notion is driven from Dragon literally being named Dragon and him also being the bane of the celestial dragon's existence and along with his story having relations with the deity Vayu and his origins with Hanuman. Furthermore, it is indicated that the Goa kingdom is actually where one of the 20 allies nations originated from, much like Dressrosa and Alabasta being similar to Goa as pointed out by Luffy and Sabo, along with the fact that Saint Jalnak, a celestial dragon, went out of his way to visit this very island. Finally, Dragon's animosity towards the celestials could stem from his mother being persecuted for marrying an human insect like Garp. But Dragon still couldn't raise his son. No way I managed to talk about Dragon for five minutes in a straw hat video. All right, that's enough copium for this three week break. But even with all of this, we all know Dragon is a deadbeat. So he still couldn't raise his son as he was the target of the world government. If they found out about Luffy's existence, they would definitely target the son of the world's most wanted man. So Luffy grew up in the care of his grandpa Garp, who threw Luffy down a deep ravine, left him alone in the wilderness and tied him to a balloon so he could grow up and become a big strong marine. Until one day when Luffy was six, red-haired Shanks showed up in Fusha village. After witnessing the red-haired pirates Riz, Luffy knew he wanted to become a pirate. Bro yearned for this life so much that he even stabbed himself under his eye to prove that he was him to Shanks. But this childish act only showed Shanks how unready Luffy actually was. Yet Luffy didn't waver. He continued to ask to join the crew until one day when bro ended up eating the gomu gomu no mi that shanks and the crew had found this charted luffy in the course he would be on now as it wasn't actually the gomu gomu no mi but the hito hito no mi model nika the meeting with shanks also led to the infamous moment with higuma coming into the bar and clowning on the crew only for them to not react at all this annoyed luffy like why wouldn't they just beat up this bum higuma when he disrespected them so much and we would find the answer when one day shanks 
was away. Higuma showed back up and Luffy stood up to him, which prompted Shanks and the crew to completely smoke the bandits. But sadly, Higuma kidnapped Luffy onto the sea, where Shanks lost his arm betting on the future Luffy would usher in. This made Luffy learn an important lesson of only fight when absolutely necessary, like to save a friend, which he does every arc on every island he ends up in. Shanks also gave Luffy his straw hat as a goal for him to aspire to, returning it once he has become a great pirate. But Luffy's true goal of being the freest there is comes from his relationship with two friends who would become his brothers, Ace and Sabo. In the care of Dadan, Luffy first met Ace who was very cold towards him. Every day, Luffy tried following Ace but he would put traps in the way to hinder him. Eventually, Luffy made it to Great Terminal where Ace and another boy, Sabo, were counting money. They were mad that Luffy found their secret but before anything could come from it, one of the Blue Jam pirates came through and saw the money alongside Luffy while Ace and Sabo hit. Luffy got captured and was being interrogated about the money but he refused to answer. Even when Bro got completely beaten half to death, Luffy wouldn't snitch. Seeing this determination, Sabo and Ace, after saving him, became friends with Luffy. This bond quickly turned into a bond of brothers where they would run around Goa honing their abilities. However, Sabo was forced to return to his noble family by the threat of the Blue Jam Pirates harming his brothers, leaving Luffy and Ace to fend for themselves. The Blue Jam Pirates, under the orders from Sabo's father, exploit Luffy and Ace as laborers and then attempt to extract information about their treasure. When the brothers refuse to cooperate, they are tied up and left in a dangerous situation as the pirates set fire to Great Terminal. Luckily, Ace manages to free himself and Luffy, but they are pursued by the pirates. Fortunately, the Dadan family intervenes, allowing Luffy to escape while Ace and Dadan confront Blue Jam. In the aftermath, Luffy and Ace are alive, but Sabo is killed by a world noble. Of course, we know that he was saved by Dragon, but Luffy didn't know that at this point. This devastating news deeply affects both brothers, especially Luffy, who mourns on the coast. This taught Luffy another lesson of equality and how cruel the world can be. That one day they are having fun and in an instant, his best friend is gone now. It had a huge impact on Luffy, imprinting on him that if he wants to be free from others' tyranny, he has to get strong enough to fight back because against the Blue Jam Pirates, Luffy was pretty much useless. So him and Ace trained tirelessly and at the age 17, he finally sets sail out onto the sea and creates the Straw Hat Pirates. Next up is God D. Usopp. He is the son of another deadbeat, probably the king of deadbeats, Yasopp. Everything Usopp does and has been in the series is a direct consequence of his father leaving to get some milk. Especially after his mother died, Usopp had no one. He was the definition of lonely, plagued by the sense of abandonment. So he would constantly tell lies over and over again throughout the village just so the villagers themselves wouldn't forget about him. But since his father left his love and duty towards his family to become a pirate, Usopp began believing that being a pirate must be something so amazing that it is greater than your own child. Hence, he too wanted to become a great warrior of the sea like his father. While it wasn't anything massive, he started the Usopp pirates in Sarah village and acted as their leader until Luffy showed up and stopped Captain Kuro's plan to take over Kaya's fortune. Usopp was already a captain before Luffy even set out to sea. Although he was leading a few kids, it still gives us a hint that just like Zoro and Luffy, who are often mistaken for captains, Usopp's origin also hints at him finally unlocking Conqueror Zaki. Which would make sense because how else do you explain the events of Dressrosa where bro helmed a whole army as God D Usopp. Furthermore, Usopp also has a very unique ability to turn his lies into reality. He told Kaya he saw a giant goldfish and landed upon an island made of its poop, which happened in Little Garden. These lies turning into reality can't be a fool. Rather, this could be a major hint towards Usopp's true lineage being from Soge King's Sniper Island. Look, we don't even know where this dude Yasop is from, all right? Nor do we know the last name of his mom who has that distinct nose. Perhaps she's from the Long Nose tribe who were feared for their immense lying capacity 800 years ago. Man, this is some bullshit. 
Seriously though, Usopp's dream of becoming a great warrior of the sea is there to show the world that he isn't just a liar who cowers at every opportunity. When it matters most, Usopp stands his ground and lives up to this dream. He represents the average man among these big hitters with their lofty goals like becoming pirate king or mapping the entire world. In comparison to that, he's but a and. However, he is still part of the Straw Hats and when he believes in something, he puts his full effort into it. But the biggest hindrance to Usopp is himself. For example, Usopp thought that him being part of the crew was only possible because of the going merry, the gift from the one he loves, Kaya. When it was time to retire her, Usopp, due to feeling that inferiority complex, would challenge Luffy to a duel for the merry and leave the Straw Hats. At this point, Luffy had a bounty of 100 million and Usopp stood toe to toe against him, gaining his respect and the ship back, proving to everyone other than himself that he deserved to be part of the crew. Usopp's importance can't be understated as he is the reason the Mary and the crew even made it to Water 7 from Sky Island because of his repairs. Usopp, due to his father leaving him for a greater adventure, was scared that this new family he found would also abandon him to chase their lofty goals as he saw himself as a burden. Why else would his father abandon him? Him if he wasn't a burden, right? As the story has progressed, Usopp keeps showing us time and time again that he is him. The Colosseum fighters wouldn't be freed without Usopp, one of the strongest devil fruit users in Sugar, who could literally turn any level of fighter into her slave, was defeated by him. However, Usopp's greatest period of growth is right around the corner on Elbath. When the Straw Hats travel to the island, he will finally meet his father Yasa, whose abandonment gave him so much grief, as well as take command of an army of 8,000 giants which will be used in the assault against the world government. But why would Usopp be allowed to lead such an army? Well simple, because Usopp has the potential for the strongest future sight hockey in the entire world. Who better to act as a general than a man who can see such lengths into the future? Don't believe me? Just think about all the stories that Usopp has told which eventually come true. The giant goldfish, the poop island as I mentioned earlier, a country of dwarves fighting a giant mole seeing Cerberus and a dragon, having a bounty of 30 million, meeting a beautiful woman carrying meat, and finally leading an army of 8,000 men, or in this case, maybe giants. Listen, when you get one or two things right, sure, that can be a coincidence, but that's like 10 plus things I just mentioned. Even if he is doing it subconsciously, Usopp is more of a prophet than even Madame Charlie at this point, and having someone like him as a general is actually insane. If you guys wanna learn more about Usopp and his lies, watch the video on screen right now that we made a year ago. Years before Luffy set out to sea, a mysterious island nation faced an awful pirate attack, only for the Marines to step in and assist them. However, even with the help of the Marines, nearly everything was destroyed. This was the Oikot Kingdom, where Bella Mare was on service and she found the orphaned Nojiko and Nami. But this is quite sus. Who are Nami's parents? Nojiko isn't even her real sister. Look at how different they look. Fear not though, because this is where Nami's balls deep weather prediction gives us a hint. Vivi tells us that it's even beyond science. It's supposed to be impossible for someone to predict a cyclone on the Grand Line, but Nami, while she is sick, is able to forecast that shit like it's second nature. Mind you, she only stepped into the Grand Line just a few days before. So you can't even claim that it's her experience as a navigator. So how is she doing this? Well, it all has to do with Nami's origin being quite special. Which ancient weapon is shrouded in mystery right now? That's right, Uranus. Now we all know Emu has used Uranus already if you follow our videos, but currently Emu is using Vegapunk's mother flame as the fuel for it. It's an artificial means means of using this weapon. What if Nami was supposed to be this field? Just like Shirohoshi was born as Poseidon who commands the Sea Kings, Nami and her weather hockey are the field that naturally guides Uranus because Uranus is the god of the skies and has control over the weather similar to Nami. Furthermore, there's a book we see Nami reading about navigation. However, the cover page is written quite oddly. The Navi part is bigger and bolder than the rest of the letter. Now, I don't know which publisher would create such a stupid cover, but Oda definitely was using this as a hint for us because the word Navi in Hebrew literally means 
prophet. So Nami's origin is that of the one who can prophesize the weather and command Uranus. Furthermore, Imusama's infatuation with Uranus led her to Nami being born at Oikot Kingdom. That was the reason for the war breaking out. It was Imu trying to get a hold of Nami for her special powers, but we all know the story of her being taken in by Bellamere instead, and Imusama was left to ask Vegapunk to create an artificial and less efficient way to use Uranus. But the community has also come up with a theory that Nami is actually genetically related to Imu. That's why she has this power and it is similar to the God Valley incident, which was attacked by rocks for his stolen treasure. The same thing could have unfolded at Oikot Kingdom for Nami. And also, you know, Emu translated in Japanese means sea and Nami means wave. So Nami is a wave created by Emu. Moving on, a few years after being adopted by Bellamere, Nami would lead a peaceful life until one day Arlong attacked Kobayashi village. He killed the only person who had accepted Nami, Bellamere, and essentially took her as a slave as he forced her to draw sea charts for him. But this decision by Nami wasn't her giving up. Rather, she made a deal with Arlong to buy out the freedom of the villagers whom she had grown with. She already lost her mother and she didn't want the rest of the people who accepted her to suffer as well. Even as a child, Nami's generosity knew no bounds. She justified her sailing from others, primarily pirates, by telling herself that she was doing it for the village and Nojiko. But of course, Arlong wouldn't keep his promise and the money she had saved up for so many years gets confiscated by the marines. And it was literally through the orders of Arlong himself too. This might have been the end of Nami's story until Monkey D. Luffy came and put on the straw hat on her head. Nami's independence and distrust of others had told her that asking for help made her weak. It made her put her burdens on someone else. However, Luffy showed her that as friends, that's not a burden. It was the obvious thing to help out a friend in need. Not only Luffy though, but Sanji, Zoro, Usopp were all ready to go beat up Arlong before Luffy even ordered them to. This showed Nami that she had found a real bond, similar to Belmare with the Straw Hats who risked their life for Nami's burdens. Cutty Flam or Frankie had been abandoned by his parents and thrown into the ocean when he was 10, but luckily he was found by the legendary shipwright Tom. He wound up becoming an apprentice under the Fishman and spent most of his time making warships called Battle Frankies that could take on the Sea Kings. Two Two years later, Tom was put on trial for making Roger's ship and sentenced to constructing the sea train as punishment, something which only took him 14 years and ultimately earned him his freedom. Or at least it would have if Frankie didn't exist. Spandam used Cuddy's ships to frame Tom by attacking the world government officials with it. Seeing his battle Frankies used for evil, Cuddy committed to vow off making more of them and disown his own creations. However, Tom smacks him and tells him that his ships are neither good nor evil, and as their maker, he should love them unconditionally. This is something Frankie still takes to heart, constructing weapons like Shogun Frankie or the Frankie laser beams. Tom's words and training are the reason Frankie even exists still, because after Tom's death, Cuddy stood in front of the sea train in opposition only to be hit by it and knocked into the ocean. Luckily, there was a nearby abandoned ship and Tony Stark, I mean Cuddy Flam, managed to repair his body by turning himself into a cyborg with spare parts. With a box of scraps! When he finally made it back to Water 7 and met with Tom's other student, Iceberg, he was given the blueprints of the ancient weapon Pluton and told to change his name so that he could keep them safe from the world government. And so, Cuddy Flam died that day on the tracks, and the supposed final battle Frankie was born with the will of Tom and Water 7 imprinted within him. Years later, the Straw Hats would arrive in Water 7, looking for a new ship, and while originally they were just another mark for his family of delinquents to rob blind, Frankie would take a special interest in them after Usopp tells him about seeing their ship's Klabouter Man, basically the spirit of the going Mary. This was proof that they loved the Mary and that she loved them. And considering Tom's last message to Frankie about loving his ships unconditionally, Frankie found a real soft spot for the Straw Hats. He ended up joining them on their journey to save Robin and with some uh, <clears throat> gentle 
convincing from Robin when they got back to Water 7. He joined the group. Come on, we know what Robin did, guys. Come on, we know what she did. Ga she gave him a handy. Like, that's why he joined the crew. But honestly, I would join any crew if Robin did that to me. Uh, let's be real. Okay, Frankie didn't come alone, though, as he also made a new ship for the Straw Hats, the Thousand Sunny from the Wood of the Atom Tree. And that brings us to Frankie's dream, following in Tom's footstep by creating a ship that manages to sail the entire Grand Line. Much like Robin, Frankie's dream is entirely in line with Luffy's journey to Laugh Tale. Honestly, almost all the Straw Hats dreams come true with Luffy finding the One Piece and becoming Pirate King. They're like a hand that perfectly fits in that glove. There is also another way that Frankie can live up to Tom's hopes for him, and that's through Pluton. Now that the crew knows where the ancient battleship is, that they will need to bring it back to the surface and repair it after hundreds of years underwater at Old Wano. However, another key detail we learn about why the blueprints exist in the first place, it's so that if the ship did fall into the wrong hands in the future, the shipwrights would be able to construct another to counter Pluton. So with Karibu about to reveal the location of Pluton and Poseidon to Blackbeard, Frankie might need to take out his toolbox and construct Pluton 2.0. Next at number five, we of course have Fibonji. Who else is doing It's the, look at the number. It's number five, Fibonji. It's match made in heaven. All right, seriously though, okay, look, you know what? I've been glazing Zoro way too much. I've, I've heard all of you Sanji fans in the comments. I'm gonna give this dude a glizzy overdrive. All right, so Sanji's origin start off over 21 years ago before he was even born in the North Blue. His father, Judge Vinsmoke, was a member of Mads alongside Vegapunk and Queen. Mads, of course, discovered the lineage factors of different animals and human species, including devil fruits. This coupled with Judge being an expert in the cloning side of things, this was a match made in heaven. Using Vegapunk's research on devil fruits, he figured out a way to insert certain properties from them into his children while they were still in his wife's Sora's womb. This was meant to make them as durable as Kuma's race, the Buccaneers, and as powerful as Lunarians, even create fire and electricity, all in exchange for removing their sense of humanity and compassion, which actually wasn't a nerf, but a buff, according to Judge, so bro was stupid. Luckily, Sanji's mom took some medicine to counteract the effects of this modification, and unlike his brothers, Sanji was born with his emotions intact and his powers nowhere to be found. While Ichi Niji, Niji, and Yonji were born with hearts of iron and bodies to match, Sanji was weak as hell, like pre-Double Dungeon Jin Wu levels, and unfortunately, this made him a target. As it turns out, wanting to cook for people instead of helping your family in their technological military conquest makes you a bit of a black sheep. But even then, Sanji's mom was there to encourage his cooking, where she even ate his mud-filled food because she was proud of him. This moment is at the core of Sanji's Sanji as a character. After constantly disappointing his father's cruel expectations, getting beaten up by his brothers on the daily, the only thing that was there for him was the food he created and the praise of his mother. However, due to the negative effects of the drug that his mother had taken to make sure Sanji doesn't turn out emotionless, she died. With her death, his father's anger and disdain for Sanji's failure also reached a new height, where he literally imprisoned his own son to save the family's face from embarrassment. However, there was still another who showed kindness to Sanji, his older sister Reiju, who, although also an augmented human, still had some emotions left. She truly cared for her little bro, but couldn't defy their father more than helping Sanji escape by making a deal with Judge to let him tell the world that Sanji was dead, but instead he would be banished from the Jerma Kingdom. If you guys don't see already, Sanji's origin directly informs his infatuation with women because growing up the only people who gave him even a shred of dignity and affection were women. His mom, sister, and I guess you could even lump in some of the maids who worked in the kitchen that taught him how to cook. His father's entire philosophy was to cut away emotion to bring out the inner strength, a very masculine way of looking at the world. However, Sanji rejected that as emotion is at the very core of what fuels us to move forward in life, not just in reality, but especially in One Piece where the strength of your hockey is determined by willpower. For example, 
example, Zoro's ability to withstand Kuma's pain wouldn't be possible if he had no emotions. Because bro wouldn't even have any feelings towards his Captain Luffy. Like, his brothers are a testament to this. Like, do you guys remember during Whole Cake Island when their plans got foiled and they were driven in the corner? These buffoons just say, ah, well, GG's, go next. <laughs> like, you're about to die. <laughs> you lost to a Yonko. They were simply bots who could only act through the commands of their father. But Sanji's experience was completely different, where it was his mother's love that allowed him to have the gift of feeling. And his sister's care for him gave him his freedom from his namesake, causing Sanji's experience to clash with his father's ideology. Hence, the reason for him putting every woman on such a high pedestal. Ain't no way I just defended this dude simping, bro. <laughs> So next time you think of making fun of five Anji simping, think again, bro. Think again. <laughs> Eventually, Sanji escaped the Jarma Kingdom and made it onto a cruise ship where he worked in the kitchen. However, one fateful day, Blackleg Zeph attacked the ship to steal some treasure. But both Sanji and Zeph got stranded on a remote rock. For nearly 60 days, they had to survive on the little food they had. Like, Zeph even had to chop his goddamn leg off to, to live. Here, Sanji learned a gruesome lesson about the importance of food and how awful hunger hunger feels. This reaffirmed his dream and goal of becoming a chef who wouldn't let anyone go hungry ever again. Years later, Sanji would meet Luffy on Baratie, the restaurant of his new mentor and father figure, Zeph. Zeph was a renowned pirate in the East Blue already. He had even been to the Grand Line, which is a big deal, guys. Come on. I know every pirate we see is in the New World and all this, but that's just how the story goes. But trust me, it's actually very rare for pirates to make it out. Even the strongest in the the East Blue with 50 ships, Don Krieg couldn't make it out. Having a figure like Zeph being there to not only teach him how to cook better, but also train him in the black leg martial arts gave Sanji the boost he needed. Although thrown away by his real family, he found a new home in Baratier. However, Sanji still had a dream to find the All Blue and cook dishes from all the seas. So with a final push from Zeph, he would set sail with the Straw Hats and begin searching for the all blue. You know, another thing to note is like Sanji's dream of finding the all blue is so childish and his father, his entire philosophy is like, cut that shit out. Like stop being a little baby, little bitch, you know? But now he's about to prove his father wrong even more by finding the all blue, this childlike dream. Like the adults don't even believe in this thing, but Sanji's gonna find it and fulfill it. Going against his father again. I, I, I just thought of that while recording, all right. <laughs> Throughout most of the story, only Sanji's own training with Zeph and the Okama Kempo he learned from Vankov helped him in his battles until Wano, where we finally learned that Sanji's Diablo Jambe and his insane dexterity were a result of Lunarian genetics embedded inside of him, with his biggest upgrade being the Jerma Raid Suit. After putting it on, his genes awakened, giving him all the benefits that his siblings received and then some. He was faster, stronger, more durable, and could even turn invisible. However, along with all these new powers came a sense of coldness. He was losing his emotions just like his brothers, something he feared so much that he even asked Zoro to kill him if he lost himself completely. This was a journey for Sanji to come to terms with his lineage. Even though he despised his father and family, he was still their son. Judge's blood flowed through him. So should he forsake his origin due to the disgust he feels for it? Or should he use it to defeat Queen and win the battle for his friends, which would lead him to lose the thing that he valued most in the entire world, his emotions. Luckily, Sanji managed to hold on to it, and we even saw his flames upgrading to blue. Of course, Sanji has a long way to go before he fully masters these new genes. By the end of the story, he'll have complete control over his emotions, even after using his Vin Smoke skills, and will evolve those genetics to a whole new level. Remember how easily he saved Bonnie, but he let Vegapunk die? Well, next time, by the end of the series, the same level of emotion and strength he showed to save his Pookie Bear Bonnie, he will do the same thing to save Vegapunk. That will be the upgrade of the century. But seriously though, he will have near immunity to damage like 
king at. And those blue flames will have their heat turned up until they turn white. All of it possible because of the power of love and emotion that the most important woman in his life, his mom, bestowed him with. Stop hating on Sanji. Stop the stop the five Anji hate. You know what? Next One Piece video, I won't even call him five Anji. Robin was the first enemy turned straw hat in the series. And prior to joining, she was an absolute menace, stealing food, working for the more evil pirate crews, and helping Crocodile take over Alabasta. However, all the terrible things she was doing were done out of necessity and not out of evil intentions. She was born on the island of Scholars Ohara, where she she lived with her toxic aunt and uncle while her mother was out doing a Yasop impression. Robin was miserable living with these people. It was for real like Cinderella, where her aunt would only care about her kids neglecting Robin. And to make things even worse, she was a total outcast with even people her age because they were afraid of her devil fruit. Of course, things would go from bad to worse when Robin's mom returned to Ohara and let the world government right to their doorstep. But everything wasn't looking as grim. As a man who would have a profound impact on Robin, who washes up on the shore and ends up befriending Robin. Saul was a giant bearing the initials of D. Although a vice admiral in the Marines, he understood how ludicrous it was to cull an entire island of innocence because they were asking questions. So he had come to warn them. This mentality resonated with Robin. From a young age, she was introduced to the gray of the world. Of course, the Marines were the bad guys who wanted to destroy her entire life, but there were also good people within it like Saul and Aokiji, who also took pity on Robin and created an opportunity for her to escape. So for the next 16 years, she would spend her life on the run. Unfortunately though, every Every friend she would make, every person who took her in, and every group she tried to join would eventually turn on her and sell her out to the marines in the hopes of claiming her 80 million dollar bounty. This garnered insane amounts of distrust towards people within Robin. But throughout all this, Saul was her rock, who kept her from going full on dark side. This upbringing also made Robin fearful of letting people in, as she was always waiting on the other foot to drop and be betrayed. So what can you do when everyone you meet turns on you because you are an infamous wanted criminal? Well, you can join a secret organization where names are forbidden. Robin would pick up the code name Miss All Sunday and become Crocodile's partner in Baroque Works where she would stay until Luffy defeated him. And then she ultimately joins the Straw Hats. Even after joining though, Robin has a rough time really becoming part of the crew. She has so much trauma from being betrayed for nearly two decades straight. She's convinced that they will just turn on her eventually. The thing is though, the Straw Hats don't turn on her. This just makes her panic more. Robin doesn't know what to do when they actually accept her. She doesn't consider herself worthy of love and goes into full self-destruct mode, turning herself into the world government in exchange for the Straw Hats being allowed to go free. Luffy being Luffy though, he would declare war on the world government saving her. And with that, Robin finally realizes that her life holds value and she wants to live. Now that she had actually committed to the whole living thing, Robin would work towards her dream of carrying on the will of Ohara and learning the secrets of the void century so she could share them with the world. On her shoulders rests the entire legacy and dream of the archaeologists who died in Ohara that day. Chopper was born as a reindeer 17 years ago on Drum Island. He didn't belong with the other reindeers. Even his parents made him follow the herd from the back because bro had a blue nose instead of a red one. But one day, Chopper would stumble upon a devil fruit and eat it. This made his life even worse because this fruit granted him intelligence. He could now feel the animosity from the other reindeers and knew that his parents ostracized him. So he left the heard trying to communicate with humans on Drum Island. However, all hope was not lost because Dr. Hiraluk took him in as his friend and assistant. This good-for-nothing doctor became Chopper's idol. Hiraluk told Chopper that all diseases in life could be cured. Although something not rooted in medical science, this resonated with Chopper and Hiraluk's evidence for this philosophy was his strong faith on the Jolly Roger or what it represented as a symbol of freedom. 
freedom and strength against all odds. But this moment of happiness for Chopper wouldn't last as his only friend's health worsened, causing Chopper to be kicked out as the old man didn't want Chopper to watch him die. However, this only hyped up Chopper more to find a cure for Herolic, so he set out trying to find an Amidoke, a special mushroom with skull and crossbones from the medical notebook. Chopper thought that this symbol meant it was a W drug, as Herolic would always gas up the Jolly Rogers and pirates. And after hearing some villagers yap about how this mushroom can heal people, Chopper set out to find it. We all know that this was actually a poison mushroom. So when Chopper brought back the Amidoke mushroom after a hard fought journey where he had to come to terms with his old herd and defeat the leader, Herolic couldn't just say no. Seeing how much effort Chopper went through believing this plant saved Herolic's life, the old man ate it. This gave Chopper a reality check, where later he would find out that the mushroom was actually a poison from Dr. Koreha. This completely devastated him, but he understood that being kind wasn't enough to save lives. You need skills and training if you want to have an impact for others. So Chopper studied under Dr. Koreha for five years, becoming a great doctor just like his mentor and father Herola. Eventually, as Chopper kept studying medicine, he would develop the rumble ball, which could modify wavelengths in zone fruits, leading to his extra forms. But something that's fishy about this is how the hell can a reindeer mess with the laws of devil fruits by just a few years of medical training? Vegapunk, with his big ass brain that can see 500 years into the future, only recently started uncovering the real depths of the zone devil fruit. Yet Chopper did it like it's just simple. This brings me to theorize that Chopper doesn't just have any old Hito Hito no Mi, but a mythical earth god model just like Luffy's sun god fruit. We know of the existence of more god fruits like Luffy's from the flashback in Skypiea. If you want to know more about that, then watch the video on screen right now. It's been confirmed that Admiral Greenbull's wood power is a Logia, so we are still in search of the forest god model. Just like Luffy's mythical zone god fruit, Chopper 2 can tap into multiple forms or points in his food. Luffy has gears, Chopper has rumble points. No other zone fruit, even mythical ones, have shown this special ability. Furthermore, why was Blackbeard in Drum Island? This guy only goes after overpowered devil fruits, and we all know Wapol or Dalton, they aren't all that. What if Blackbeard was there in search of Chopper's Hito Hito no Mi among the mushrooms that are found in Drum Island? Also, we know Chopper got influenced by Herolic to pursue medicine, but his obsession with him trying to find a cure to all disease is very interesting. We all know the nature of a zone comes through to the user and just like how nature has a healing effect on humans, Chopper is doing the same but in a literal sense with his special drug he will create at the end of his journey. Possibly being the reason Luffy survives from disease that took Roger's life. Of all the straw hats, Jinbei is by far the weirdest to talk about in this video because before joining Luffy, bro had an entire anime worth of story arcs happen to him. Like this man is 46 years old, I, I didn't even know people could live that long. But Jinbei a story starts as an orphan in the Fishman district. He wasn't alone as he had his buddies Arlong, Marco, and Fisher Tiger alongside him. This camaraderie led to him to train in Fishman Karate and earn a black belt, leading to him joining the Neptune army where he served until 15 years ago. During his time in the army, Jinbei protected everyone, even commanding Arlong to stop harassing new recruits, showing that he wants to protect the weak. His time as a commander of the Fishman army definitely matured him a lot, way more than Luffy. Jinbei's role is to steer the crew in storms, like when he used his fishman karate to get rid of Kanjuro's fire in Onigashima, or saving Luffy from drowning in Egghead. Jinbei always knows what the correct order of business is, and that's thanks to his training and discipline as a user of fishman karate and having a military background. However, Jinbei would eventually leave his post at the Neptune army to join Fisher Tiger Sun Pirates after he was branded an enemy of the world government. As a Sun Pirate, we really get to see Jinbei's philosophy, where he starts screaming at the marines for overlooking slavery and branding them as criminals for saving people. This is at the core of Jinbei. He has a very strong sense of justice and morality where he wants to protect the weak from being bullied by the strong, a complete juxtaposition to Arlong who believed in tormenting the weak humans. Furthermore, Jinbei also took to heart the word about not 
not hurting humans from Fisher Tiger to Ark, who at this point was more like a mentor to Jinbei. Finally, Jinbei saw firsthand the reason for the animosity humans and fishmen have for each other through a girl they adopted named Koala. She was deathly afraid of the fishmen because they were these big scary looking guys whom she knew nothing about. But as time went on and she became familiar with them, they grew close, proving to Jinbei that fishmen and humans aren't that different. The only barrier is the unfamiliarity between the two groups. After Fisher Tiger's death, Jinbei took over the Sun Pirates and championed the same ideals as Fisher Tiger, eventually becoming a warlord of the sea. Jinbei's familiarity with humans would grow to a new level when he came under the protection of Whitebeard and became friends with Ace, which eventually leads to him meeting with Luffy and joining the crew. Now, Jinbei's goal is for him to assist Luffy in taking down the world government, breaking apart the red line. In doing so, they will finally be able to fulfill Joy Boy's, Otohime's, and Fisher Tiger's promise and dream to end discrimination between fishmen and humans. Luffy might be the new Joy Boy, but Jinbei is the one who inherited his vow to bring the people of Fishman Island to the surface so they can live their lives freely under one sun. Unlike the other Straw Hats though, Jinbei has lived his life and grown. He's not going to get all that much stronger than he currently is. And to be fair, there isn't much room to grow. He's already immensely powerful and aside from mastering hockey to an even higher degree, maybe in Elbaf, he's kind of peaked. However, that's okay because Jinbei isn't trying to be a fighter. He has always wanted to be a peacekeeper and fighting has just been a means to make that a reality. What's more, when the all blue has been created and the seas become one piece, it will enable fishmen to truly live everywhere in the planet and work towards equality in a much more widespread way than ever before. Moving to Brook, he was originally a member of the Rumbar Pirates, a musical crew that spread happiness wherever they went. They even had a baby island whale named Laboon as a crewmate who traveled with them. Unfortunately, when the crew headed to the Grand Line, they needed to leave Laboon behind at Twin peaks with Crocus, making the promise to return after just a few years once their journey was complete. However, the crew never made it. A disease spread through them and wiped many of them out, with the survivors ending up wandering into the Florian Triangle where after a battle with another crew, their ship broke down and they floated aimlessly until all passed away from being poisoned. Unlike the rest of the crew though, Brook had the Yomi Yomi no Mi and got a second chance at life, but his spirit wouldn't find his body again until he was just a skeleton with an afro. Brooke would spend the next 50 years in isolation on the ship, surrounded by the corpses of his friends. Imagine what that does to a dude's psyche. However, he still had his violin and the promise to meet his friend Laboon again alongside him. This kept him sane and stopped him from losing hope. Eventually, Brooke would land on Thriller Bark, where Moria stole his shadow and he would need to stay out of sunlight until the Straw Hats arrived and whooped Moria's ass. Brooke was originally pretty hesitant to join another crew. However, it turned out they had something in common. Like the Rumbar pirates before them, the Straw Hats had met Laboon and promised to return to him. Which means by joining the Straw Hats, Brooke's dream of being reunited with his friend would also come true. This is probably the simplest of the dreams of the crew. Like Brooke would have literally gone and met Laboon during the time skip, but Brooke paused himself so that he could complete his dream alongside the rest of the crew. Not only keeping the promise to Laboon to sail the Grand Line, but also the dream of the Rumbar Pirates. However, it doesn't just stop there. Originally, Brooke wanted to play a tone dial containing his crew's music for Laboon. But as Brooke continued to master his devil fruit, he has also become more in tune with his connection to the underworld. The ultimate manifestation of that will be conjuring the spirits of his dead crew crewmates where she won't have to rely on just a tone dial and instead they can play their favorite tunes for Laboon in spirit. Now finally, let's move on to Roronoa Zoro, the vice captain and the second strongest in the crew and his strength, just like Sanji's, derives
derives from his lineage factor. In One Piece, your DNA plays a big part in your strength. Zoro is no different, as 21 years ago, he was born in Shimotsuki village to Tera and Roronoa Arashi, a descendant of the legendary sword god Shimotsuki Ryuma, the same beast who till this day is hailed as the pinnacle of a samurai. He was so strong that bro defeated a freaking dragon. This powerful bloodline is pretty much an ability within Wano. For example, Zoro's uncle, Shimotsuki Ushimaru, was a daimyo of Ringo before the fall of Wano. However, Zoro didn't have the childhood of a noble. Rather, he became an orphan before he even got to know his parents. But luckily, his relative, Shimotsuki Koshiboro, took him in as his pupil in his duel. This is where Zoro would start his training, where at the age of eight, he became strong enough to defeat adult swordsmen. However, his cousin and rival, Kuina, just completely outclassed him. After Zoro's 2000 loss, though, they finally opened up about their frustrations. Kuina told him all about how she felt her talent was on a clock because she was a woman. But Zoro vented about how much he hated losing to her and how if she really believed that, then his eventual victory wouldn't mean anything. So together, they vowed that one of them would become the greatest swordsman in the world. Kuina would never get the chance though because the deadly assassin down the stairs would show up and take her life. Instead, Zoro would take up her sword and vow how that he would carry the burden of both their dreams by himself. This is at the core of Zoro's hockey. Whenever he's in a pinch, he draws on from the promise to Kuina to not lose. An example is how Sandai Kitetsu being caught by him in his fight against King, literally saving him and leading to King's defeat. However, Zoro's origins provide him with another factor, which is key to his power. On his way towards the peak of swordsmanship, he became a famed bounty hunter in the East Blue. And eventually was taken prisoner in Shellstown for defending a young girl being attacked by Helmeppo. Luckily, he had become so famous that his name even reached the pirate Monkey D. Luffy. They meet in Shellstown, where Zoro is strung up by Morgan. At first, he's against becoming a pirate. However, after seeing that Luffy's dream as just as crazy as his own, he agrees to join the crew. It doesn't hurt that Luffy gives him an ultimatum of fighting off marines together or being executed by them, but Zoro is actually impressed by Luffy's anything to get his way mentality and ends up joining the Straw Hats. Traveling alongside Luffy, it wouldn't take long before Zoro came face to face with the reality of his dream. If he wanted to become the best swordsman in the world, he would need to defeat Dracul Mihawk and he gets his chance on Baratie. But Mihawk absolutely bodies him, we all know the story, and Zoro vows to never lose another battle with a swordsman again, strengthening his will and hockey once again. Since then, Zoro has grown quite a lot, but to find finally reach his goal of becoming the best, he will need to fully master his sword. We've seen him master Kitetsu already, this coming in the form of Ashura. He's also starting to master Enma, which we saw as the king of hell form. However, it's still a struggle to use this effectively. What is still up in the air though is the Waroichi Monji, which is fitting since this was Kuina's sword. When Zoro finally earns the title of the Sorongis Swordsman, that is when the Wado will awaken, a new form for him. The the ultimate symbol of his and Kuina's dream manifested. This will be the power which allows him to either defeat or impress Mihawk to the point of inheriting the title of the world's greatest. But if you guys want to know more about Zoro, then I did a whole one hour long glazing session on this guy going over everything about him from the beginning of his story to what's going to happen in the future. So go check that video out right now.